Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here today, as is um, my firm, Fidelity, that I work for. Happy to be here as a, uh, to represent this important conference. We love it when women gather together and share and uh, knowledge and learn together. And I wanted to start out by saying that I think women overall are really great with money. And I've seen it my entire life. When my um, father decided to start his own business when he was in his mid-20s, he's now 80, he's still a small business owner here in the state of Utah, um, I watched my parents struggle with trying to make ends meet as any new business owner is. And I saw my mother do wonders with how to handle a budget. And I also have memories of my grandmothers who lived on fixed incomes really create moments that were magical without a lot of um, resources. And I think we are the ones that bring memories to the family and we are good budget stretchers. So just to start off, I think women are really clever with money. And what I do at Fidelity is I help people, individuals, families like you save for their future. So I wanna start out the importance of investing smart. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what stocks to buy today because that would be far too individualized. So this is gonna be more of just general investment savvy that I'm gonna share with you today. And I also wanna uh, start with telling you a brief story. This story was highlighted uh, in a publication magazine that Fidelity puts out. It was about a couple named Dick and Barb. Now, Dick and Barb had done all the right things. They saved for retirement, they funded their 401ks, they put their kids through college, they celebrated weddings, and they were starting to welcome their grandchildren into their life. And um, Dick was tired and he wanted to retire, so he did exactly that. He gave his notice at work, and in celebration of retirement, they moved to Hawaii, which was exciting. They loved Hawaii, they loved to go there every year. And so they put a for sale sign in front of their home. They sold their, son, their home. They found a beautiful piece of property in Texas or in um, Hawaii, and they built their dream home. They went into architecture, built a great home, and they were living the dream. The only problem with that dream is they got lonely living in Hawaii with no family. So they're booking it back to the States, going to all the important events of their family. And then in addition to that, they um, wanted their kids to have part of the enjoyment of being in Hawaii. So they were flying their kids, grandkids over for visits. And then a catastrophe happened with the market. We had a financial crisis that many of us know all far too well. And Dick became alarmed and made an, an appointment with our firm. And we did an assessment. How much are you spending? How much do you have? And then we ran the analytics and we said, this does not look good, your plan fails. And so owning their story, which is what we're gonna talk about, why we wanna get started now, how we help our clients get organized, uh, building your plan, and then owning your future. So this couple decided to own their future. They put a for sale sign in front of their home and why they moved back to the States, they lived, moved in Texas where their grandkids were, and they went from a situation where their plan failed to a situation where their plan actually started uh, surviving and thriving. Um, they were not allocated correctly. So we're gonna talk about the importance of being um, allocated correctly. So what role are you currently playing? Are you in the driver's seat taking the lead? Are you more of a backseat passenger? or, uh, or uh, uh, in the driver or passenger seat, or are you in the back seat, not actively involved at all, or are you just along for the ride, just kind of doing the wing and the prayer, hoping it all works out? And we know that typically doesn't work out very well when that happens. So um, Fidelity did a research study. This happened in 2018. We love follow, uh, following investor behavior, especially female behavior. And these statistics were specifically about women. And we found that most women didn't feel good about investing because they had three misconceptions. So we wanna debunk these theories. You, um, we found that in our survey that women believed that you needed to have a lot of money to start to get investing. That's simply just not true. You can start with a very little amount of money to get investing. In fact, you can open an account with 
um, just $100 if you wanted to and with no fees. So it's very doable to start being an investor. The second myth is that you had to be a good stock picker. And then the third is you needed to have a lot of knowledge to know how to be an investor. And again, that's just simply not true. You don't know, have to know how to pick stocks in order to be an investor. Many of us in our professional lives aren't stock pickers, so we wouldn't expect to be, have you be good at it. But what you do need to know is that you can come and get help. And that's what we, uh, the kind of services we have to offer. So this was an interesting uh, statistic. We know that women are gaining financial power. 60% of all undergraduate and graduate degrees are currently being earned by women, which means women have the potential of making more money. We also know that 50% of women are the primary breadwinners in the US currently. And this is far different than it was like 20, 30 years ago. That just wasn't the case. And then this is where the real power you guys have the power, I'm telling you right now. 80% of the decisions that are made in your household right now are being made by women. So you have more influence on your family household budget than you think you do. So um, statistically also 90% of all uh, women at some point in their career or lifetime will be in charge of their own finances. And the reason for that is really threefold. One is women are either getting married later in life, they're either choosing to not get married at all, or they just simply outlive their male uh, partners. And so um, if there's 200 people in this room, only 40 of you won't be responsible for your own finances, but the rest of you will. So that would be like the first like couple of rows are good, the rest of you, you got to figure this out now, and we want you to start being responsible and finding out where you are. And then this is a great statistic. Um, also, of all people living to be 100, 80% of those are going to be women. So we need to have more gas in the tank than our like male spouses that we're planning for because we just simply live longer. In our research, we also found that outside of a 401k account, only 44% of women are investing outside of what their employer offers. And this is just a statistic that we'd like to see be a little higher. This is the reason why they're not. They think they don't have enough money. They don't know where to go for help. It's a division of labor thing. Or you don't consider yourself to be an investor. So you, women just don't like to do things that they're not good at. So they just don't. Now, in that same study, this is what the reality of the data is. So um, fidelity across all of our segments, whether it's a 401k, a 403b, a government plan like a 457, an IRA account, we have millions of investors across all of our business units. And this is what we discovered, that of the over a million assessments of these accounts, we um, found that women are actually saving more, more money per check, paycheck than men. And even if they make the same amount of money, they're still saving more than men. We also found out that over the past five years, women are actually better investors. Their return, if a man and a woman put their money in the market at the exact same time, women actually outperform men. And there's two reasons for that. The first is that they tend to have a plan. They kind of know, like, we're used to making cakes and cookies, not me to, like, you know, say that that's not what we do, but we follow recipes. And so we go to someone, we say, what should we be doing? Teach us how to do this. And then we follow that recipe as a, where a man might say, well, I'm going to th do this. Like Bob or Tom told me to do that. And we tend to listen to more of professional help than doing what maybe the guys are doing. So we're just better at, at following those instructions. And um, that's a big, that's a big, uh, a difference maker between um, men and women. We also find, found that of all the investors in this same survey, what demographic is currently saving the most outside of a retirement savings account? And believe it or not, it's the new millennials. So are there any millennials in the room? Okay, you guys are rocking it. A lot of the reason this is happening is because you have access more to data than like the baby boomers did. So information, technology, advancements are helping women understand their situation uh, earlier in life, and they're doing um, a much better job at saving outside of what their employer has to offer. 
So getting organized, so how much should you invest? So you wanna be an investor, but you're not sure how much you should invest. So this is kind of our general rule of thumb. 50% of your money should go towards your essential expenses. 15% should go to your retirement savings. 5% should then go into short-term savings. And then the other should go to lifestyle. So this would be your charities, Christmas, holidays, vacations. Essential expenses are gonna be your housing, your uh, personal care, your food, your insurance, your transportation. It's all the things that you have to have to keep all those glass balls up in the air. And then the 30% is gonna be more of your, your fun money. So we believe in the, what we call the 15-55 rule, 50% savings, or essential expenses, 15% retirement savings, and then 5% towards your, your short-term savings. So building your plan. So you st have to start with the goal. So we know that at some point, everybody in this room, the, the number one goal usually is gonna be retirement. That's usually the plan everybody knows and understands. But then in addition to that, you might wanna buy a new home or a vacation home. Maybe you wanna buy a condo. You wanna put in your budget enough money that you can just travel a lot. So that would be one idea of a goal. The other is you might wanna help save for college. You might want to take a big vacation, like a, like a big vacation, something that's like extraordinary, or even planning for a car. So everybody's goals are different. And then fundamentally, you need to invest for either a short-term goal or a long-term goal. So how in financial world, how we decipher that is if you need the money within zero to five years, you want the money to be invested in short-term investment products. And then if you have five years or longer, then we are going to invest for the long term. That's usually five years or longer. So one of the advantages of participating in a company-sponsored 401k plan is due to the fact that these um, contributions that you're making are growing tax-deferred, meaning this is money that's never been taxed. You're putting the money directly into your 401k account. It's being invested, and you're not paying taxes on that until you actually pull the money out of the account. It's easy and convenient. You don't even have to think about it. Your employer just takes it right off the top. Before you get your paycheck, it's already invested. And so it's super convenient. And then you get, the, of course, the advantage of the compounding. And then you get, um, it can lower your taxable income every year because, again, the contribution that you're making is coming in after tax. So this is the question. For some reason, this is kind of set up a little different. But this is the question. So for all of you out there, you can just shout out the number. What times your annual income should you have in a retirement account by the time you're 67 years old? What do you think? Is it six times, eight times, 10 times, or 12 times? 10? Yep. 10, 12? Yep. The answer is you should have at least 10 times your annual income by the time you're 67 years old. So we set this out by benchmarks. You know, the millennials in, this, in the room, this is kind of the track. By the time you're 30, you should have one time. By the time you're 40, you should have three times. By the time you're 50, six times, 68, and then 67, you should have 10 times your income. Now, if you don't have that, don't panic. Just start where you are today. Just start at the very, start where you are. Don't worry about the past, just start going forward. So, it's really important to protect what you already have. So would it be safe to say everybody in the room has at least a bank account, a checking account, some type of, a, some type of a, an account that you're saving in? Um, might have a 401k, an IRA a account. It's really important, and we see this all the, t all the time as a big mess, is to, that you don't have beneficiaries on that account. Um, make sure even on your checking account you have a beneficiary because if you pass away and there's no name beneficiary and you're the only one on the account, it'll go through probate. Perhaps it would go through probate, depending. So make sure that you're protecting what you have. We encourage you to have a will or a trust to protect your, your assets. Decide if you want to have a guardian on your accounts, power of attorney, and then to consider. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, they moved it up. Okay. Better? Okay. Maybe I'll just unclip this. Now I 
broke it for good. <laughs> okay, better? Okay. And then um, we want you to have your plan updated, at least annually. And this is why, because um, life events happen, markets shift. And so we don't want you to be invested too long, kind of like Dick and Barb, who went to Hawaii. They weren't allocated appropriately for their situation. And so if a downturn comes, it's a, it's a game changer. So we want to make sure that we're always managing to your, to your goal and to your age and in, invest in the most appropriate way. So let's talk about organizing your future. These are the fundamentals of, that, of investing. So of course, the first thing you have to determine, is this a long-term or is it a short-term goal? And then we have to identify how much risk you're willing to take with that money. And then we want to, at that point, after that's been assessed, we want to help you determine what is the right asset allocation. And that means how much should be in like safe investments like cash or a CD or a money market, how much should maybe be in a more stable investment like a bond, or how much should be exposed to stocks where your greatest potential for growth and earnings lie. So what is a stock? So somebody tell me a favorite stock out there. I don't want to pick one. So just say a stock. Exactly. Apple. I knew someone was going to say Apple. My, I have a son that works for Apple. OK, so if you buy a share of Apple, you're actually an equity owner. You're part of an owner of, of the company. And in exchange for that, if the company uh, does well and the stock price goes up, you make money. It's great. And if they pay a dividend, they're going to give you more shares of that stock. And if that continues to go up, every time that compounding of that dividend that they pay out plus the organic growth of the, the stock going up, you're going to benefit from that. So um, stocks inherently carry um, more risk. They are most appropriate for someone that has a long-term investment time horizon. If you need the money in three months, you probably don't want to enter into the equity markets because it's way too volatile. So these are, a stock is not a short-term play. This is a long-term strategy. The value does go up and down. And of course, with a stock, the higher the risk could also mean the potential for a higher return. Then the next thing that you could consider to invest in would be a fixed income investment, which would be a bond, is typically what we think as a bond. Now, bonds are issued either by a corporation or they're issued by a government entity. So let's just use the Salt Lake Airport for an example. Um, a bond would have been issued. People would have gone and bought into the bond. And what you're doing in that situation is you're not an equity stakeholder, but you're actually giving a loan to the city of... Salt Lake or Utah bond company that did this airport. And then in exchange for that, they're going to measure out interest payments back to you. At the end of the term of the bond, let's say it's a 10-year bond, whatever you put in, let's say you put in $10,000, you get your $10,000 back. But all along the way, you would have been earning interest income. And so they tend to be more of a moderate type of an investment. They tend to not go up and down in value as fast as stocks. And uh, they tend to stable out an investment portfolio. And then third, a short-term investment would be like your money markets, your treasury bills, your CDs, uh, your stable value investments. And in exchange for that, of course, low risk. So the potential for gain is, of course, smaller. So a mutual fund, which most of you are probably aware of if you have a workplace savings account like a 401k, 401k, 403b, 457, uh, your employer typically is going to give you a myriad of investments to choose from in the mutual fund families. And so what a mutual fund is, is let's say everybody in this room decided to put money into a pot, and then a fund manager would take everybody's money and invest it in many different stocks or many different bonds, so you're you have a greater uh, amount of diversification within a pooled investment, and it also has lots of liquidity, so you can move in and out of it a little easier without uh, being forced to, for example, if Apple went down in value and you needed money out of the investment, you're not necessarily taking a big hit out of Apple at a price when the market would be down. So it's a more, um, it's, it's a more directed or targeted type of a way to be invested in a more diversified way. And then we also see a lot of 401ks and uh, 457 uh, employer-sponsored plans 
offer the target date timeline funds or the asset allocation funds. Target date, let's say you're going to retire in the year 2050. It's going to be more aggressive now. And as you get closer to that age of 2050, the investment's going to automatically all on its own become more conservative. So it's really a no-brainer. Like, I don't even have to think about this. I'm just putting my money in. The fund manager's handling it for you. And these are terrific investments for you to consider within your work safe uh, place savings account. Asset allocation funds work the same way. They just don't have the data associated with them. So with you and a prof uh, financial professional, you can decide when you start moving the funds a little bit more conservative. Now, in 1969, if someone gave you a gift of $100 and you just put the money in a straight money market account, which would be the purple line on the bottom, you can see that in 50 years, you would have approximately after adjusted for inflation, you'd have about $1,000 in the account. If you invested in bonds, you'd have around 3,200, and in stocks, you'd have more like $10,000 in the account. But look at the volatility. The purple line with the stocks, definitely you can see you have to be um, able to take on uh, the ups and downs of the market. And if you're invested for the long term, who cares? You don't need the money right away, so you just in invest it for the long term. We believe that you should have a little bit of all of this in your investment structure. Now, this is where the real power comes along. So back to the beginning of why do this now, why start now, is the power of the compounding. So if you put in $5,500 a year into an investment account, and that's all you did, in 10 years with compounding, your initial investment of 5,500, which you 55,000, which you put in yourself out of your pocket, would grow, and you'd have a return of 32 percent. And then, as you go, you can see that by age 40, you'd have a significant amount of money in the account, over a million dollars, by just putting in 5,500 dollars for 50 years. This is a uh, this is the dynamics of compounding, which is so extraordinary. And then, of course, the asset allocation mix. So we'll start on the left-hand side. Aggressive growth investments. These are for people that are in it for the long term. They don't need the money in the long term. This is a long-term strategy. And you have to have a high amount of tolerance for risk with the market. You have to understand that you're going to see the volatility. Then someone for growth. Maybe they still want participation in the market, but they don't want to be super aggressive. So then we would have a growth strategy. Again, this is an investment that is still for the long term. You want to still have at least seven years or longer for this type of a strategy. And then a balanced allocation is going to be someone probably more like needing the money within six years or even maybe a little longer. This is a really appropriate um, strategy for many investors who are even retired, you need to keep your money invested in the market so that you can keep up with inflation. And then a conservative strategy would be really for a much older demographic or for someone that needs the money in the short term. There's just no appetite at all for any uh, volatility in the market or a little appetite, but you don't want to lose a lot in a downturn. So as you can see, the greater the risk, the greater re reward with a conservative investment over time yielding about 5.96, where an aggressive investor year over year is going to be about double that at 9.65%. So you can see how um, exposure to the equity markets can definitely help you. So, in getting organized. So, um, get organized, build your plan, and then own your future. So, um, in conclusion, I kind of want to end with my own personal story on why you want to get organized now. And um, I wasn't going to cry, but you know, this personal stories always get you. So, um, two years ago, February, my husband and I decided we were wanted out of the cold, we wanted out of the snow. And so we headed down to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona for a week. We'd planned a trip. We had a son who had been serving a, a service mission for our church. He was coming home. We were going to spend a little time with him. And um, we were there about 24 hours. And we got a horrible phone call from our second daughter who told us that her husband had tragically passed away that night. Just like minutes before we got the phone call. 
And so, um, of course, as a mother, you just can't get home fast enough, right? I mean, it was like the sheer night of pure misery, wondering how I could get home to my daughter, who at the time had a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and was six and a half months pregnant with their little third daughter, Lainey. And so as my husband and I just wrestled all night long, I, I insisted we drive home. I wanted to get home. My husband was like, so we are. By the time we rent a car and get home, you'll get there at the same time as if we just fly home in the morning, which is what we did. And as we discussed the evening, we kind of borrowed a lot of trouble. She was moving home. We were going to have to help her raise her kids. We wondered what kind of financial situation they were going to be in. We wondered if they were swimming in credit card debt. We know she didn't have any student loan debt because we didn't want her to. So um, we knew she was in good shape. But you know, once they get married, you don't really ask how they're doing financially. <laughs> you know, you just want to have them over for Sunday dinner, um, and you know that's that's what you want to do. And so um, she actually surprised me and came today. So I am making her come up and kind of tell her story. So I'm going to tell you what she told us when we asked her share. Well, good, now that you're crying. Um, yeah, so, hello. Um, I'm Michelle, Sandra's daughter. Um, she had originally kind of asked me to just jot down some of my thoughts on this, and then I shared them with her, and she was going to kind of use the bits and pieces she wanted. But so this is kind of a surprise to stand up here um, when she asked me to do this. So uh, I'll do my best to kind of go through uh, my thoughts on this. Um, but ironically enough, it's funny that I'm the child of hers that's standing up here to talk about how to have financial success. Because one of her favorite stories to share of me is usually the story of how not to be financially successful. Um, when I was a sophomore in college, she, um, she loves to tell this story. She had called to check on me at the end of, uh, end of a semester. I had just finished finals for that semester. And man, I was barely scraping by that semester. Uh, she would sometimes check in on my bank account and see how it's doing. And I think at the time I had maybe like seven or $8 left in my bank account at the end of this college semester. And she asked, hey, how was finals? What are you doing? And I said, man, I'm going out to celebrate. Finals are over. My friends and I, we're going to go party. We're going to go get a really nice dinner. And, you know, with kind of uh, not alluding to the fact that she was checking in on my bank account, she also kind of nudged, well, how are you going to pay for that meal? And um, I, I just proudly said, I sold all my textbooks, mom. I've got some cash in my pocket and I'm ready to go burn it. So it's funny that I'm the one that she, um, she had said to come uh, talk a little bit about how I was able to become financially um, stable. And uh, I've, I've learned a lot over the years. Um, and like she said, you know, once you kind of get married, you, you really don't know necessarily what situation you're getting into. Um, I was fortunate enough to have my parents help, help pay for my college where I didn't have to... Um, I didn't have to get student loans for my education. My late husband was not so fortunate. When we were newly married, I remember just feeling like we were swimming in debt with student loans. Um, and you know, we were going to school both full-time, working part-time, doing our best to pay off these student loans, to both pay our, off our car payments, um, and also just trying to pay for the tiny little apartment that we were living in as newlyweds. And um, it wasn't long after we were married that my husband started becoming really insistent that we um, figure out our finances. He was a soldier for the Utah Army National Guard. And so he, he, he realized and he learned really quickly that life is fragile and that you need to be prepared for the worst um, and, and, and to have a plan in place that if the worst comes, you're prepared. And so he was really good at um, helping us get our finances in order. It was a lot of hard work of years of just barely getting by and doing our best to save what we could to get out of debt. But soon we found that um, we were able to um, we were able to become financially secure over the years. We were able to pay off all of his student debts, and we were able to pay for our cars we were able to save enough to make a substantial down payment on our home that we purchased and remodeled with our savings. 
And um, sorry, I'm going to kind of go back to my thoughts of what I had written. Um, and while it was difficult to kind of have that restraint over the years, we, we soon found that our financial diligence was, was just simply paying off. Um, we weren't wealthy by any means, um, but, um, you know, it, it never seems like you have enough money, I guess. But, but we worked hard from an early age on, and from early on in our marriage to find a financial plan that would work for us and that allowed us to, to look for and have the future that we wanted. But it, honestly, it wasn't until after Mark um, passed away that I really started to understand the importance of having a financial plan in place. Um, because when a loved one dies, the very last thing you want to be worried about or thinking about um, is where you are financially. But of course, I found myself thinking that over and over and asking myself the question, would I have enough to sustain the life that we had worked so hard to build together. Um, and in the days and in the weeks that followed Mark's passing, um, I was able to just breathe a huge sigh of relief because as I started to gather and assess my financial s situation, I realized that we had done exactly what we should have done to prepare for this moment. Um, we had sufficient life insurance on my, on my husband and I had enough in savings to get me through those first initial rainy days. And I knew that if I needed to, I had the training and the knowledge and the experience that would be necessary to go back to work and provide for my family if I needed to. Um, now, while I don't, you know, trust me, <laughs> one, of us, one of us dying was not what we had in mind when we came up with our financial plan but how grateful I am that we were diligent in becoming financially stable because it's allowed me to continue to stay at home with my children and raise them in the way that we had envisioned together. And it's granted me just one less thing to have to worry about. It's allowed me to not have to worry about how we were going to pay for things in the midst of heartache and rebuilding and just moving forward. It's given my children the hope for a brighter future. And with the help of my mom, who knows so much, and also my portfolio advisor and many of the um, things that I've had to do as I've jumped into that driver's seat and I've had to train myself and learn and become familiar with, with all of these different aspects of, of financial strength, I've just realized how important it is to know, to know what your plan is, to create that plan, and to, as your life adjusts and as your life changes, to to change those goals and, and change your plan with it. Um, because I can also promise you, and I'm sure my mom can attest <laughs> to this, that selling textbooks at the last minute is not a financial plan that will get you by. <laughs> so. Okay, give her a little hand for me. Okay, so this is what my husband and I did when we found out they were in pretty good shape. It made us very happy. So it's, it's strange to think, but you know, um, you know, my biggest um, happy money moment is knowing that people like my daughter and people like you that we get a chance to help are in good shape financially. And so this is the takeaway that I want to give you today is do not safe harbor this information because the ones that need it the most don't have access to the data or they don't think or believe that they have enough money that they can get started. Take this data, go home and share it with your daughters, share it with your sisters, tell your sister-in-laws, share it with your sons, share it with your everybody you know. Say, you should have 10 times your income by the time you're 67 years old. And then, you know, we go to big book club, and I'm not saying start an investment club, but I am saying, you know, we exercise together. Let's be savers together and think of ways that you can do better with starting to invest in yourself. Because when you retire, unlike now, you decide you want to get, go get a new loan, buy a new car, and Gail Miller would love that if you did. There's a loan for that. But where, what you can't get a loan for is to pay for your retirement. That is, the onus is on you to make that happen. And so um, I'm not sure how many more minutes we have. 15? OK, so does anybody have any questions? I have two advice to 
to not um, contribute more to a 401k than what the employer matches. Is that accurate? And are there better investments or is that the case? Uh, the question was, um, she was told that she shouldn't invest more than what the empl employer matched in a 401k, and was that good advice? And so to that, I would say it's always a good idea. We would always lead with maximize what you can put into your 401k. So the income limits have actually gone up, so you can actually put in a bigger percentage than what your most employers are willing to put in. So we would first say maximize your 401k contributions, and this is why. Those contributions that are going in are going in um, pre-tax. So it's money that's never taxed. So it's helping keep your income down now. And then even if you can save beyond that, then look to see if you qualify for like a Roth IRA because those investments grow completely tax-free. So you put the money in now and you get all that compounding. Remember how I showed you that compounding chart where if you put in $5,500 in over 50 years, 30 years, it grows to a substantial amount of money, and then you get to take that out, out tax-free, a Roth IRA is a great idea to do that. So. So we're at the point right now that we have you know, in-laws and you know, things like that. We're trying to really make sure that we understand where their finances and everything are. Um, what do you think about reverse mortgages for older people? Because that's the only place that they can. Okay, so um, the question was, um, she has in-laws that are considering a reverse mortgage because that might be their only option for income, and she wanted to know if that is a good idea. So typically with a reverse mortgage, that's going to be your very last resource to go to, but it can be an option. It allows you to stay in your home. It allows you to basically... You're just taking the equity out of your home and living off of that. And then when they pass away, it basically, the bank owns the home. And then if they sell it, you get the difference from what you all want it versus what the value is. So they're sticky. They can be expensive to get into, we say, kind of last resort option. Don't do it as like a great idea because it's a last resort kind of an option. Okay, so the question was, name three ways to get invest started with investing. So if you are, the easiest thing to do is if you are employed and you can participate in a 401k, absolutely make sure you're doing that. And make sure you're taking up to the free match that your employer is uh, giving you, because otherwise, if you're not doing that, it's free money you're living on the table. So that would be one. The second would be to um, just... I'll just use Fidelity as an example because that's who I work for. You can open up an online account. You can call and talk to somebody. The call is free. We don't charge for guidance on helping you find a fund to invest in. You used to have to have a minimum of $2,500 to open an account with our firm. I can't speak for other firms, but you could consider these with other firms as well. And um, we used to require you have a minimum of $2,500 to get started, which for a lot of people could be a stretch, right? Well, we kind of like are proud of the way we break barriers, especially we love helping women get started because like the slides indicated, 50% of you are, um, you know, the primary breadwinners of the family. And so sometimes just not having the extra amount of, you don't have just 2,500 to get started, but if you could start with 100, you can now go into a fund with 100. So the call's free, the online uh, tools that we use are excellent. Um, if you are really good with technology and, you'd like, and you're, you don't mind putting some information in a tool, we do a really good job of telling you how to get that money invested. But you can also make the phone call, which is free, and we're 24-7. So you can call and get guidance um, very, very easily. So that's the other great way to do it is, yes, you can do an on online, online account. And I would say at a minimum, when we talk about having an emergency fund, um, you should have an, enough emergency money to last you a minimum of three months to cover your essential expenses. So even if you were to just call, um, I'll use Fidelity again as example because that's who I represent, you could open up a, an account with no minimum and you could go into one of our money market accounts and 
I don't know what banks are paying, but you can usually get a decent rate of return on a, one of our money market accounts with no minimum and there's no fee, there's no account fee. So it's a really inexpensive way for you to get started. So you could start an emergency fund as well. So I would say start with an emergency fund. Once you have that, then consider moving some of those extra monies once you have that in place into an asset allocation fund that you would be comfortable with. Okay, so the question is, is um, she has an IRA that's a traditional IRA, and she also has a Roth IRA, and she's um, not working. She's a stay-at-home mom, right? Yes. Okay, did I assume that right? Yes. And she wants to know what is the best one to keep adding money to. So let me ask you a question. Is your husband, are you married? Yes. Okay, and you have earned income. He's employed. Okay. So, yes, you can make a, a IRA contribution. And even if you're not working, you can make a what is called a spousal um, contribution into an IRA. Depending on your income limit, you can do one or the other, but would have to make more. But if you qualify, the Roth IRA would be optimal because it's that compounding is all tax free when you take it out. It's a great program. So, if you qualify, the Roth, between the two, a Roth would be the winner. Based on, but it's it's based on your income. Is it seventy two hundred in the max for the year for the Roth? Uh, for a Roth or a um, traditional, either way, you can't do both. Sometimes we get people calling in saying, "I want to fund a Roth and I want to open a traditional IRA." It's one or the other. You can't do both. Um, this year, the contribution limit is. Um, 6,000 and you can do a catch-up contribution to if you're 50 or older by an extra thousand. That doesn't include rollover, though, right? If you rolled over Right, okay, so this adorable lady just asked if she rolled her money from one qualified account into another. So this would just be like you're not working at your firm anymore or your employer and you wanna roll it into an IRA. That is not considered a contribution. So you can contribute in addition to rolling your money over. Well, it depends on the account value. So we would be very careful on that because when you do a conversion, so what she's talking, so the question was for those that didn't hear, can you take money from a traditional investment like a 401k or a traditional IRA and then convert that into a Roth IRA so that then the, the, the future uh, compounding happens um, tax-free? And we would say it depends because um, if, she, let's just say, for example, she's still working and let's say she had a million dollars in a 401k account and she converted the whole thing, she'd have to pay tax, income tax on that, which would be like so expensive. It would move her into the top tier tax bracket. So we may say we need to evaluate and work with your tax advisor to help you decide whether or not that's a good idea. Okay, so the question was, she has a, uh, an account at Fidelity, and then she has a 401k account through an old employer, and there might be some benefits of keeping some money in a 401k versus rolling it into a, a, a traditional IRA. So this would be the benefit of keeping it in the 401k. Um, when I get asked this question, um, some of the um, advantages would be it's protected from creditors if it's in a 401k. So remember when O.J. Simpson, whole thing happened, and, the, and there was a civil lawsuit against him. The Brown and the Goldman family didn't have access to any of his 401k money because it was protected. That's probably one of the biggest advantages. Um, where you're limited by keeping it in there is your employer is doing a very nice service for you by offering a 401k account, 
And it's, it's a benefit. It's part of your overall compensation. And so when you're offered a 401k, um, you know, it costs your employer money to have that plan. So if they come to a, like us at Fidelity and they say, we want you to administrate our plan, they're paying us to do that. And so in order to keep that plan so they can afford it, they're going to maybe give you 20, 30 options at best. Once you roll it out and into an IRA, so let's say you're not now worried about creditors anymore, which most, most people aren't, but it, in case, um, it opens up the window for you to do more. Like you can do a CD, you can buy a mutual fund, you could buy individual stocks is where you're really handcuffed in the 401k to only offer probably 30 mutual funds that your company is going to um, allow. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, we, we have a few more minutes. Any other questions? Okay, so the question is, how do you feel about investing in real estate versus the traditional way? So, believe it or not, you can buy mutual funds and you can buy what are called real estate investment trust products in a brokerage account. I know that's not your question, but you can own real estate. Um, when I had the tiers up, like you can invest in stocks, you can invest in bonds, and then you can invest invest in like short-term products like CDs or money markets. There are at a benchmark investments that you can also invest in like real estate or gold or precious metals or currencies. You know, there are other things that are what we would consider to be an at a benchmark investment. Um, but we think it's great. It, we think it's important to have a, you could do both. So a lot of people have um, maybe a, um, a rental, you know, they ha own a, a rental income. So they've got a little rental income coming in you know, to help supplement income. So we think it's fine. We think it's okay to have both. So I totally do the investing world. I, I'm looking to invest in, kind of like you're saying, short-term and long-term investments. And stocks are things that kind of always just gone over my head. So when, let's say I tried to call for value, and I want to invest in some stocks. Do they take the junior stock option, or do they pay out for you? Is it like a Okay, so the question was, she's new to the uh, thought of being an investor, and she loves the idea of maybe being able to buy an individual stock, but she is like one of those surveyed people that says, I just don't know how to do this, so would Fidelity help me pick a stock? And this is the answer is, um, we tend to not give individual stock suggestions just because of the, the true nature of the volatility that comes along with those. However, we have these amazing tools on our website, and you can all go to our website and, and look at these. Um, but we have these really robust trading platforms where we give you research and we give you ratings on the stocks. So we'll let you know if, if the research analysts are rating that stock as a buy or if it's a sell or if it's just kind of a neutral, just buy it and hold it. So you'd want to call and... Um, our brokerage department is extremely robust. Our trading platform is really exp inexpensive, so you can trade for $4.95 when you buy however many stocks you want, and then when you sell them, you know, it's really inexpensive to be a stock investor if you want to go that route. But when you're starting, you should get some guidance from a professional who can help you do that, and you can get that help for free. So the idea here is you have access, and it doesn't cost you anything to get it. Okay, so the question is, she's got young adults who she wants to have a, a solid foundation, um, and she wants to know where to get, get them going. And so in this uh, situation, we'd want to assess their situation, um, and then would probably suggest is they're brand new, just starting out, probably like a good asset allocation fund for them to start in, and that they can just gradually get that money going, and then once they get a bigger pool, then we can talk about further diversification, but an asset allocation fund is a great place to start with like a very small start out balance. And the, the key here is getting going now so you have time in front of you to make this money work for you. So I think we're uh, out of time. 
Oh, one last question right here. Okay, good question. So she said if she wanted help and if she were to call a Fidelity, and I'll say this is probably true across the industry, you would just call and say, I'm interested in opening an account, and then we actually have everybody that you would talk to is licensed to be able to give um, advice, and they're licensed to help you choose funds, so anybody should be able to help you. But as people ask you questions, they'll be able to point you in the right direction. It's an investment account, right. Okay, thank you for coming, good luck, thank you.